good morning as discussed in the previous lecture today in this lecture we will start from this lesson which is the first of a few lessons on the module of algebraic eigenvalue problem uh, i will again remind you that in order to follow the lectures in this segment it is very important that the subject matter of this segment this module is thoroughly uh, immersed in your understanding and therefore it is very important that at this stage you should have completed most of the exercises of this segment because some of the uh, background necessary for the following lectures is actually developed through the exercises in the book in the textbook that i have referred to you in this tutorial plan the problems of the book listed here you must have completed by now and that will help you in following the lectures in the coming module uh, which is chapters 8 to 14 now in this lecture we will be studying eigen values and eigen vectors in which we will talk about the eigen value problem as an introduction and then generalized eigen value problem which will also uh, expose you to the to one of the practical problems from which eigen value problems emerge then we will discuss some basic theoretical results which will be utilized later for sophisticated methods of solving the eigen value problem and then towards the end briefly we will discuss a quick and easy method of solving the problem which is power method to begin with i again draw your attention to the mapping a which is from r n to itself that is from n dimensional space to itself that means it is a the corresponding matrix is n by n it is a square matrix now when we multiply a vector to uh, a, a matrix to a vector uh, the vector gets mapped to another vector in the same space in this case but then in this mapping there are two effects produced on the vector one is a magnification which may be less than one which means in that case the actual vector will get reduced in size the other than magnification the other effect is turning rotation now this is the general way in which a vector can get mapped through multiplication with a matrix now some of the vectors for every matrix are special they are special in the sense that they undergo only magnification or scaling and do not rotate under multiplication with a particular matrix these vectors are in some sense the own vectors of that matrix or some special vectors for that particular matrix and these vectors are called eigen vectors the word eigen in german means special or own so as if these vectors belong to this particular matrix so if you multiply the vector a matrix a to one such special vector its own vector then the result the mapping is nothing other than a pure scaling so in that case we call this vector v as an eigen vector and the scale factor lambda is called the eigen value or the characteristic value together lambda and v eigen value and eigen vector are quite often referred to as the eigen pair they form a pair now determination of all the lambdas and corresponding v's that is eigen values and eigen vectors for a given matrix is called the algebraic eigen value problem now how we can find the values lambda and the corresponding vectors v from only this much the process the underlying uh, concept is actually very simple you can take this lambda v on this side though you cannot write it as a minus lambda into v because a is a matrix and lambda is a scalar so but what you can do is that this v you can write as identity into v and then take lambda i and a together in this manner take taking 
a v on this side, then you will get lambda i v minus a v. Lambda i is a matrix and a is also a matrix. Then you will have this system of linear equations. Now, you will note that this system of linear equations is n equations in this vector or n variables and these equations are homogeneous equations. That is the right hand side is 0. Then you know that for a homogeneous system of equations for the existence of non trivial or non zero solution the coefficient matrix must be singular that is the coefficient matrix must have a null space and v will be actually a member of the null space of this matrix lambda i minus a so for singularity of this matrix you must set its determinant equal to 0 now you find that we have reached a stage where from a large number of unknowns we have suddenly reduced to one unknown in this particular equation you had one scalar unknown lambda and one vector unknown v which was n plus 1 total number of unknowns now the condition that the coefficient matrix is singular tells you that determinant of the coefficient matrix is zero now you have got a single equation in a single unknown in addition you know that this side is a polynomial in the unknown lambda polynomial of degree n so then the question boils down to finding the roots of that polynomial to begin with or to find the solution of this polynomial equation and we know that it will have n roots including multiplicities right so the polynomial on this side is called the characteristic polynomial of the matrix a and therefore the corresponding equation this equation is called the characteristic equation and its solutions are the eigen values so characteristic equation or characteristic polynomial will give you n roots of this nth degree polynomial these are the n eigen values and for each of them you will try to find the corresponding eigen vectors that part should not be very difficult because as you insert those eigen values one by one for every eigen value sitting here you will get a homogeneous system of equations in which the coefficient matrix is completely known all that you need to do is to find the null space of that known matrix lambda i minus a which we have studied earlier now we have been just talking about the number of eigen values total number of eigen values from this will certainly be n but that may be repeated for example suppose we have got a 3 by 3 matrix for which the eigen values may turn out to be 2 2 and 4 that is possible so here the eigen value 2 is said to have an algebraic multiplicity of 2 because it is occurring twice in this polynomial so this polynomial will be lambda minus 2 whole square 2 appearing twice into lambda minus 4 4 appearing only once now we also talk of geometric multiplicity that is when we take this eigen value lambda and try to insert it here and try to find v now in this particular example if the eigen values are 2 2 and 4 then as you insert lambda equal to 2 here and you try to find the corresponding eigen vector v you would expect that there may be up to two such vectors one eigen vector belonging to lambda equal to 2 in the first instance and the second one belonging to lambda equal to 2 in the second instance you may succeed in finding two such eigen vectors or you may not that depends upon the particular matrix a that means that if the algebraic multiplicity of a particular eigen value is more than one then that may give you one eigen vector corresponding to it or two eigen vectors or three eigen vectors up to the number which is the algebraic multiplicity that means in a larger matrix if suppose an eigen value say this eigen value lambda equal to 2 in a 7 by 7 matrix appears 5 times so the eigen values are 2 2 2 2 2 something else and something further of this structure in that case corresponding to 2 eigen value 2 when you try to find out the eigen vector 
you may find only one Eigen vector, you might find two or three or up to five, more than five you cannot get. That number corresponding to that particular Eigen value, how many Eigen vectors you could find out that number is called the geometric multiplicity. Now, note this one is algebraic, this one is geometric. Algebraic multiplicity is appearing from this polynomial. How many factors lambda minus a particular lambda is appearing in this polynomial? How many times that is appearing? That is coming from an algebraic source and that is why it is called algebraic multiplicity. On the other hand, the number of corresponding eigenvectors will span a subspace in the space R n of the dimension, which is equal to the number of linearly independent eigenvectors that you can find corresponding to that eigenvalue. And this description of this subspace that you are talking about, that is a geometric entity. That is why that number is called the geometric multiplicity of that eigenvalue. Now, note that when we are talking about finding eigenvectors, different eigenvectors, then in that context, linearly dependent eigenvectors are not considered different. That means, if you find one vector as an eigenvector, then it is obvious that twice of that will be certainly an eigenvector. So, that is not counted as different from the first one. Similarly, if you have already found two eigenvectors corresponding to a particular eigenvalue, then a linear combination of these two will certainly be an eigenvector with respect to or corresponding to that same eigenvalue that is not considered anything different. So, that means, when we hunt for eigenvectors, we look for linearly independent eigenvectors. Now, when it happens that for a particular eigenvalue, the algebraic multiplicity and geometric multiplicity have a mismatch between them. That is algebraic multiplicity is higher, geometric multiplicity is lower. In that case, we call that matrix as defective in what sense it is defective, what is the defect and what to do in such a situation that we will discuss in detail in the coming lectures. When it is so, that algebraic multiplicity and geometric multiplicity for every eigenvalue is same. In that case, we can do certain interesting things very easily. We can diagonalize the matrix. That means, we can change the basis for representation of this mapping in such a way that the resulting matrix representation for the same mapping, the same linear transformation turns out to be diagonal. That means, the directions get completely decoupled. So, such matrices are called diagonalizable. To recognize a diagonalizable matrix, the direct straightforward thing is to check the algebraic and geometric multiplicities of every eigenvalue. If they match all of them, then that matrix is diagonalizable. If a single eigenvalue has a multiplicity mismatch between algebraic multiplicity and geometric multiplicity, then that is not diagonalizable. In that case, the eigenvectors cannot be decoupled, the space cannot be decoupled in terms of individual eigenvalues in the same way as diagonalizable matrices. So, actually the diagonalizability is that way not a property of a matrix as such. It certainly is a property of a matrix, but it is actually the property of a much more fundamental thing underlying the matrix that is the linear transformation. So, diagonalizability is actually the property of the linear transformation for which the matrix is just one representation. Now, considering these things apart, does this outline um, try tend to suggest that eigenvalue problem solution method is complete. It may look so, because finding the determinant of a matrix in terms of lambda is something which we can think of. Then setting that equal to 0 and getting a polynomial equation is something which is which does not sound very dangerous. And then solving a polynomial equation also is something with which we are acquainted. After finding the lambda putting that here and for every lambda finding the corresponding eigenvectors that also as a part problem is not very difficult problem. But does it mean that all the 
discussion in eigenvalue problem gets completed here? Answer is no. The reason is that when the degree of the polynomial equation goes very high in that situation, solving this polynomial equation is actually not very easy. In fact, for solving a polynomial equation, one of the very popular, one of the very used methods says that try to solve the polynomial equation through the methods of eigenvalue problem. So, therefore, for solving an eigenvalue problem, the polynomial equation solving as a sub problem is not a very attractive proposition, because as the degree of this polynomial goes high, it will be very difficult to computationally solve this problem. Therefore, people look for other ways of cracking this eigenvalue problem directly without first making a recourse to this polynomial equation solving problem. And in that attempt, mathematicians have developed a plethora of interesting uh, tools to handle matrices and express them in canonical formations and take a lot of advantage from these theoretical developments into several fields of applied mathematics. And these interesting developments we will be studying in the coming lectures, including this one. So, in order to make the ground for that, I will need to develop some basic theoretical results first. Even before that, it will be a good idea to see a practical problem from which eigenvalue problem appears. There are many such practical problems in almost all branches of science and engineering, where eigenvalue problems suddenly turn up. One such problem is the uh, system of mechanical system with free vibration. For example, if you consider a one degree of freedom mass spring system for which the dynamic equation is just this, where m is the mass and k is the stiffness of the spring. And then you try to write the assumed solution of this equation in the form, because you know what kind of a solution this will have, this will have a sinusoidal solution. And so, you try to write it like this. And then you differentiate it twice and insert in this, right. So, you know that twice differentiation of this will produce minus omega square sin A is a constant. And from that very easily you work out the natural frequency of vibration in which this mass spring system will undergo natural vibration. Now, when we try to formulate and solve the same problem for a multi degree of freedom system, we do not get such a nice simple scalar equation, but we get a matrix vector equation in this manner. So, free vibration of an n degree of freedom system will be governed by this equation, where m is the inertia matrix, k is the stiffness matrix, x is the vector uh, representing the coordinates of the system and x double dot is certainly the acceleration corresponding to that. Now, in this problem, when we ask this question, what are the natural frequencies in which this particular mechanical system can execute natural vibration and correspondingly, what are the vectors x along which those vibrations will take place. For example, in a 3 d uh, 3 degree of freedom system, it might happen that x 1, x 2, x 3 give you a particular direction, a particular vector along which the vibration takes place in one frequency. There is another second direction in which the system may vibrate in a second frequency. Similarly, a third direction with a third frequency. So, what are these for, uh, vibration modes and what are the corresponding frequencies? That becomes the problem for solution in the uh, in this free vibration problem. Now, again in analogy with this equation, we now try to assume something vector x is equal to an amplitude vector into a term like this. So, there we assume a vibration mode first in this manner. The vibration mode x is a constant vector phi into sin omega t plus alpha. Again, we differentiate it twi twice with respect to time and insert that x double dot here. And that will tell us that this whole thing is equal to 0. 
because sin omega t plus alpha after twice differentiation will produce a factor of minus omega square. So, that minus omega square gets multiplied here. So, you have got this. Then the same argument we use, what we would use in this case that is for this to be equal to 0 for all time, this part has to be 0, because this one will not be 0 always. So, this has to be 0. When we do that, then we get the corresponding equation k phi equal to omega square m phi. Now, this resembles the eigenvalue problem that we discussed just now. In the earlier case, we got a problem of this manner k phi equal to lambda phi a x equal to lambda x or a v equal to lambda v. This is the kind of problem that we have been discussing just now. Now, here it is this problem is not exactly the same as this problem, because in this location there is a matrix sitting. Okay. Omega square you can identify with this lambda, but here there is a matrix sitting. That is why this problem is not called just eigenvalue problem, but it is called the generalized eigenvalue problem. As if in the original eigenvalue problem, there was a matrix here which was identity, which indeed we inserted when taking it on the other side. right? Now, in this case, in this particular case, it is generalized in the sense that in place of identity matrix, now there is a non-trivial matrix sitting there. Now, how to solve this problem? Because if we take it on the other side, then I mean in place of i, if we have m sitting here, then as we take it on the other side, we will get k minus omega square m, that will be the matrix, okay. not the straightforward a minus lambda i as we would get in the ordinary eigenvalue problem. Now, how to handle this? One might suggest that if we pre multiply both sides of this equation with m inverse, then immediately we get this problem m inverse k phi equal to omega square phi. Why not solve this problem? Because m inverse k we can take as a, we know m, we know k, we can evaluate m inverse k and then it becomes an ordinary eigenvalue problem. Indeed, it is possible to do that, but then it is not a good idea. Why doing this is not a good idea? The reason follows from the nature of these matrices that appear in these locations. This is not just some matrix and this is also not just some matrix, this is an inertia matrix and this is a stiffness matrix. Such matrices when appearing in practical problem have certain structure. A stiffness matrix is always symmetric, an inertia matrix is always symmetric and positive definite. Now, if we evaluate this m inverse k that may lose the symmetry that was originally there in the original problem. Now, it is not a good idea to take a step in the solution of a problem, which actually makes the original problem difficult. Later, we will study in detail how solution of a symmetric matrix eigenvalue problem is actually much simpler and much more straightforward compared to a general non-symmetric matrix. Therefore, it would be a bad idea to take a step, which will spoil the symmetry of the problem as originally given. Rather, we should try to take a measure, which will utilize this particular structure. So, what we do is that we take this symmetric positive definite matrix M and recall that for a symmetric positive definite matrix, there exists a Cholesky decomposition LL transpose. So, if we conduct the Cholesky decomposition of this matrix M, in this form L L transpose and then conduct a coordinate transformation. The original coordinates phi are now transformed to this phi tilde through this L transpose new basis. Okay. In that case, when we insert this here, then see how this will look like. We have k phi equal to omega square m phi. First of all, in place of this m, we will write L L transpose. The moment we do that, we get this L transpose phi, which we are going to define as phi tilde. right? 
So, L transpose phi we are defining as phi tilde. Now, on this side also we would like to have phi tilde right, because we are applying that coordinate transformation. So, if phi tilde is L transpose phi, then what is phi in terms of phi tilde that will be found through the pre multiplication of L transpose inverse. Now, when we do that, we get L transpose inverse phi tilde right. Now, we say that we can get rid of this L by pre multiplying both sides with L inverse. As we do that, from here L inverse L gives us identity and we have got this. Now, notice that the original generalized eigenvalue problem like this has been transformed to this problem k tilde, call this whole thing as k tilde. Okay. Then, we have got the new problem as k tilde phi tilde is equal to omega square phi tilde. So, in the new coordinate system in which phi tilde is the vector, we have got an ordinary eigenvalue problem in which this matrix k tilde is actually symmetric, because k was originally symmetric. On this side, we have multiplied it with L inverse and on this side, we have multiplied it with the transpose of L inverse that will preserve the symmetry. You can just check that its transpose is itself L inverse k L inverse transpose. As you take the transpose of this whole thing, you get the same thing back. So, the symmetry is preserved. Now, note here that when we wrote L inverse transpose or L transpose inverse, for this it is not clear whether we are talking about this or we are talking about this, whether we are talking about the transpose of L inverse or whether we are talking about the inverse of L transpose that is not clear in this notation. Still this notation is valid, because in these two cases the result will be same and therefore, this L with minus t here actually means any of the two, because these two are always going to be same. Now, this is one practical problem from which you get an eigenvalue problem. There are many other situations in all of science and engineering from which eigenvalue problems suddenly appear. Now, we will start with some of the basic theoretical results of the eigenvalue problem, over which we will build up later methods by which to solve the problem. Apart from that, as a byproduct of this process, the theoretical results will also provide us with tools to handle matrices in nice elegant and canonical ways, which is useful in many uh, areas of applied mathematics, wherever matrices appear. Now, first is the first important result that we should always keep in mind is that eigenvalues of the transpose of a matrix are the same as those, uh, those of the original matrix. This is very easy, because we know that determinant of a transpose is the same as the determinant of an original matrix and the characteristic polynomial is found just by the expansion of a determinant. So, these are obviously the same. Of course, eigenvectors need not be same. In general, they are different. Next important point that we should remember is the situation for a diagonal matrix and a block diagonal matrix. You know what is a diagonal matrix? So, suppose we have got a 3 by 3 matrix in this manner, these are all zeros, these are all zeros and this is a diagonal matrix and it is very clear that these diagonal entries are actually the eigenvalues of this matrix and the corresponding eigenvectors are the natural basis members. For example, if you multiply 1 0 0 with this, then obviously, you will get a 1 0 0, which can be written like this. So, that shows that you have a v equal to lambda v, right? v is 1 0 0. That means, a 1 is an eigenvalue and this vector E 1, the first base natural basis member is the corresponding eigenvector. Similarly, A 2 and A 3 
will be the other Eigen values with corresponding basis members uh, corresponding Eigen vectors as E 2 and E 3 the natural basis members. Now, this is obvious. Now, if you say that this is actually a much larger matrix, this block this A 1 is replaced with a matrix a square matrix, this A 2 scalar is replaced with a square matrix and similarly this A 3, then what you get is not a diagonal matrix, because this square matrix may have of diagonal entries, there will not be a diagonal matrix, but what you call it is block diagonal matrix, which will look like this, in which this matrix A 1 is filled up quite a bit. Okay. Now, when you talk of eigenvalues of a block diagonal matrix, then there is a very interesting situation that the mat uh, the eigenvalues of this large matrix is the eigenvalues of A 1 and the eigenvalues of A 2 and the eigenvalues of A 3. So, if this is r by r, this is s by s, this is t by t and everything else outside these blocks is 0, then the r eigenvalues of this, s eigenvalues of this and t eigenvalues of this separately obtained can be all put in a list and this r plus s plus t numbers will be the eigenvalues of this large matrix okay. and the corresponding eigenvectors, they are also very easy to find, they are just coordinate extensions. For example, if suppose this small matrix A 2 has an Eigen value lambda 2 with the corresponding Eigen vector as V 2, then just above V 2 you put as many zeros as, as required to fit the size of this matrix and below that you put as many zeros as required to fit the size of this matrix. And then as you multiply this you find that this gives you lambda 2 into that same old vector. That means, that the uh, an Eigen value of A 2 is the Eigen value of A also and the corresponding Eigen vector of A can be found through a coordinate extension over V 2. As, as many extra zeros are required above and below, you can put that and then you get the big vector, which is an Eigen vector of this matrix, large matrix corresponding to that same Eigen value. For diagonal and block diagonal matrices, the situation is very simple. The matter gets a little complicated when we talk of triangular matrices. A triangular matrices, a triangular matrix will have non-zero entries here. Okay, but still, the diagonal entries are the eigenvalues because below that everything else is zero. So when you try to write the characteristic polynomial, you write lambda i minus this. So you will get lambda minus a one, lambda minus a two lambda minus a 3 something 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 here, but below you have got everything 0. So, when you try to expand this fellow's determinant, you get you expand from the first column, then you get lambda minus a 1 into something plus all zeros. Then that something again gives you lambda minus a 2 into something plus all zeros and so on. So, for a triangular matrix, you will find that obviously, the characteristic polynomial will emerge as a product of these factors. That means, that you have got the characteristic polynomial already in factorized form. That immediately gives you a 1, a 2, a 3 etcetera, the diagonal members of the original matrix as the eigenvalues. But eigenvectors is a different question. For that, you have to do a lot of calculations to find the eigenvectors. Eigenvectors are not so obviously visible here. Okay. So, when we handle triangular matrices, we talk directly in terms of the eigenvalues only, not eigenvectors. Eigenvectors can be found with some further processing, they are not so obviously visible. Now, when we take a block triangular matrix, that is, if these scalars are replaced with matrices and there are big blocks of zero, uh, uh, zeros sitting below that and big blocks of other entries, perhaps non zero many of them will be non-zero are sitting here, then we have a block triangular matrix, which will look like this. This is a block triangular matrix with four blocks, block A square, block B not necessarily square, block 0, which is also not necessarily square, it will be the size of the transpose of B and then block C, which has to be square. Then 
you say that the Eigen values of this is the same as the Eigen values of A and the Eigen values of C. Now, for this matrix, this statement that the Eigen values of this large matrix is a collection of Eigen values of the matrix A and the Eigen values of the matrix C can be easily seen in a similar way in which we saw just now the result related to the diagonal matrix. However, here the statement is made only for the Eigen values and not about the Eigen vectors. So, if the matrix A has an Eigen value lambda with an Eigen vector V that is this, then we can apply the complete matrix H over a coordinate extension of V 0 and then we find that the product gives us this. That means, V 0 the coordinate extension of V turns out to be an Eigen vector of the complete matrix H with the corresponding Eigen value lambda. However, when we try to ascertain verify that the same holds for C also, then we cannot immediately apply it on a coordinate extension, because that will create the confusion with this B, because in the product the way this 0 helped in this case, it will not help in the other case. So, in this particular situation what we do is that we take mu as an Eigen value of C and then argue then it is also an Eigen value of C transpose and then C transpose w turns out to be mu w for that mu for some vector w and then we apply not h, but h transpose on the appropriate coordinate extension of w in this manner and then we find at the end that we get mu into this vector 0 w. That means, mu turns out to be an Eigen value of h transpose. Okay. Then that will mean that mu is an Eigen value of h as well. Now, apart from these results, there are a few points which we need to keep in mind, which will be very useful in many of the methods. One is that if we add a scalar times identity to a matrix, then all the Eigen values get shifted by that scalar value and uh, this is called the shift theorem. This is very easy to verify and so, I am not going into that, I am leaving it for you. Then the other important issue that we must keep in mind is actually applicable only for a symmetric matrix. That is for a symmetric matrix A with mutually orthogonal Eigen vectors, a fact that we will verify in the next lecture. For a, an Eigen value lambda j with corresponding Eigen vector as v j, we find that if we construct another matrix B from in which from A we have subtracted this part, then this resulting matrix B has exactly the same Eigen structure as A. Eigen structure means same Eigen values with the corresponding same Eigen vectors, except that the Eigen value corresponding to that particular Eigen vector v j is no more lambda j, but it is reduced to 0. That means, the information worth of that Eigen value only has been removed from A. The all the rest of the information of the Eigen structure remains as it is. Now, this is an important issue to which we will come back after studying the symmetric matrices in detail in the next lecture. Before that, I will try to expose you right now to an important quick and easy method for solving the Eigen value problem and that is called power method. This helps you in finding the Eigen values of a matrix when you are not interested in finding all the Eigen values of a large matrix, but you are interested in finding only a few largest magnitude Eigen values or perhaps the largest magnitude and the lowest magnitude Eigen value. Eigen values. Now, this is very quick and easy method, easy to understand, easy to implement, but note that it will work only for those matrices which have a full set of n Eigen vectors, that is which are diagonalizable and for which there is a single Eigen value which has the largest magnitude. That means, that the largest magnitude Eigen value has a magnitude which is larger than all the rest, that is not two are at the top, only one Eigen value is at the top. In that case, power method gives you the largest magnitude Eigen value very easily. What we do 
for that is first to understand the way it operates, you consider that if the matrix A possesses a full set of n eigenvectors, then these eigenvectors will span the entire space R n. And that means, any other vector x that you can think of can be expressed as a linear combination of these vectors in this manner. Now, it is a different matter that given a vector x, we can choose any vector x that will have a representation as a linear combination of the eigenvectors with alpha 1, alpha 2, alpha 3, etcetera representing the corresponding coefficients. Now, even though we do not yet know those eigenvectors and the corresponding coefficients, but we know this much that any vector x that we can think of that we can have picked up will have some representation like this with alpha 1, alpha 2, etcetera and v 1, v 2, etcetera currently unknown to us. Now, if on both sides we multiply with A the matrix, then what happens? On this side x is a known vector which we have picked up. So, we multiply A x, we can work out the result. On this side we do not know what is happening exactly the numbers we do not know in detail, but we know this much that A v 1 will be lambda 1 v 1, A v 2 will be lambda 2 v 2 and so on. That means, through a multiplication of A, whatever was the representation here, now in the coefficients we will get another additional factor of lambda 1, lambda 2, lambda 3 etcetera. If we go on multiplying the vector, the resulting vector with A once more, once more, once more, then after p such multiplications on this side we will have a to the power p x which is known, which is the result of multiplying A p times over x. On this side we will have alpha 1 into lambda 1 to the power p v 1 plus alpha 2 into lambda 1 lambda 2 to the power p v 2 and so on. If we take that lambda 1 to the power p outside, then this will remain inside right. Now, under the assumption that the lambda 1 eigenvalue is the largest magnitude eigenvalue and the next one is a little below that, what will happen is that as p goes too high many, many, many times it has been multiplied, then that will mean that in that case lambda 2 by lambda 1, lambda 3 by lambda 1 all being of magnitude less than 1 after raised to large power all of them will tend towards 0 when p is sufficiently large. And that will mean that after many such multiplications, we will have a vector sitting inside this which is in the same direction as v 1. And then after that process has stabilized, after that direction has been stabilized, one more application of that same multiplication with A will mean that on this side an eigenvector is being multiplied with A and that will give you lambda 1 into that vector. And that gives you the vector in the direction and the lambda 1 as the scale between two successive values. So, as p tends to infinity, this fellow tends to this lambda 1 to the power p alpha 1 v 1. Then you find that after the process has converged, then you will find that the result a p x compared to the result in the previous iteration, previous step are two vectors which are in the same direction. That means, the ratio between the first components, the ratio between the second components, and the ratio between the third components will all be same and that ratio is lambda 1. So, at convergence all n ratios will be same. In fact, that is the test that convergence has taken place. So, this way you quickly get the largest eigenvalue, largest magnitude eigenvalue note that it may be negative for that matter, it does not matter. So, you will get the largest magnitude eigenvalue and the corresponding vector will be the eigenvector. Now, we will make two points here. One is that other than the largest, if you need the least magnitude eigenvalue also, then how to do that? For this purpose, we can use the shift theorem. So, how to find the least magnitude eigenvalue? What we can do is that after finding this largest magnitude eigenvalue, we see its sign this is a ratio which may have a sign. So, whether it is positive or negative that it has been found here. So, if so for example, suppose that lambda 1 turns out to be positive, 
say the largest magnitude eigen value is 23. Then what we can do from the original matrix, we subtract 23 from all the diagonal entries. That is application of the shift theorem. That is we subtract 23 i from the original matrix. That will mean that all the eigen values have got shifted leftward by 23. That means, whatever was 23 earlier that becomes 0 now, whatever was 21 earlier that becomes 19 and so on. In that case, the smallest magnitude, smallest algebraically that turns out now as the largest magnitude eigen value, largest magnitude. Then we can apply the same power method once more and then we will find that which is the largest magnitude eigen value. And then as we shift the thing back 23 steps on the right side, then we will get the appropriate correct Eigen value for matrix A with the corresponding Eigen vector. Right? So, this is one way to find the largest and least magnitude Eigen values, which has a lot of practical significance. Now, one more possibility of a import of an important question may be that for example, if we are not interested in finding all Eigen values, but we are interested in finding a top few. The largest magnitude ones lambda 1, lambda 2, lambda 3, lambda 4 etcetera. Some say 6 of them, 6 top Eigen values we want to find out and the corresponding Eigen vectors. There also for example, the matrix suppose is 100 by 100. We are not interested in all the 100 Eigen values and their Eigen vectors, but only top 6 or a few top ones with some conditional requirements. Then what we can do after finding the largest one, we can use deflation. This will work in the case of symmetric matrix, which is quite often uh, encountered in practical situations. By deflation, what we can do is that we can subtract the part, which is contributed by this particular Eigen value lambda 1 and the corresponding Eigen vector. Then the resulting matrix will have the largest magnitude Eigen value as lambda 2, which can be found through power method and so on. Now, this is a very uh, straightforward method, which can be applied if you are sure that the matrix does satisfy these requirements. Otherwise, the process may not operate as expected or as desired. Now, apart from these things, there are two important concepts, which will go long way in our discussion in the coming lectures. One is the Eigen space. This is a term to uh, in use for representing a subspace of R n, which is composed by the eigenvec eigenvectors of a matrix corresponding to the same eigenvalue lambda. For example, suppose A has an eigenvalue lambda corresponding to which there are k eigenvectors v 1, v 2, v 3 up to v k. Then that will mean that any linear combination of these eigenvectors is also going to be an eigenvector. You can verify that very easily. Suppose corresponding to Eigen value lambda, there are two Eigen vectors v 1 and v 2. That will mean that a 1 a v 1 is lambda v 1 and a v 2 is lambda v 2. Then, if we apply a on a linear combination of these two Eigen vectors, then we will find that this will turn out to be a 1 is scalar. So, we can take it out and then we will have a 1 into a v 1, which is lambda 1 lambda v 1 plus a 2 into a v 2, which is lambda v 2 from here and taking lambda scalar outside this common, we find that we have got this. That means, the matrix A multiplied over this vector gives us lambda into this vector. That means, if V 1 and V 2 are two Eigen vectors corresponding to the same Eigen value lambda, note that it is applicable for same Eigen value. Then, any linear combination of them is obviously going to be an Eigen vector with respect to for the particular matrix A. Now, this is not an a linear uh, linearly independent Eigen vector, but this is certainly an Eigen vector. It does not come in the counting of Eigen vectors, but whenever required this vector does operate like an Eigen vector. And that means, that if 
these k eigenvectors are corresponding to the same eigenvalue lambda, then the complete subspace spanned by these vectors gives you a subspace in which every vector, every vector is an eigenvector. And therefore, this particular subspace is also called the eigenspace of A corresponding to that eigenvalue. There is another important theoretical point that will be uh, quite in our discussion in coming lectures that is similarity transformation. This is something which we have already earlier seen once and here we look at some important properties of it. If we decide to represent the vectors of a space R n in a different new basis S and therefore, the matrix representation of a linear transformation changes from A it becomes B, where B is S inverse A S this we have seen earlier. Now, note that determinant of lambda i minus a, which is the characteristic polynomial of the matrix A. Now, we already know that determinant of a matrix and the determinant of its inverse are reciprocals of each other. That means, that if we multiply this with determinant of S and also with determinant of S inverse, we are actually making no change, because this will be reciprocal of this. We also know that determinant of the product of three matrices of the same size is same as determinant of p into determinant of q into determinant of r. Now, what we have got here is determinant of p into determinant of q into determinant of r. That means, this is same as determinant of p q r. That means, a single determinant with s inverse inserted from this side and s inserted in this side will be the same as this. Now, when s inverse and s are inserted on from the two sides on this, they cancel each other, because identity is sitting inside. So, that is why this is lambda i. On this, it will have the effect which is different, that is s inverse a s, which is b. That means, we have got this whole thing same as determinant of lambda i minus b. What is that? That is the characteristic polynomial of the matrix B. Now, that shows us that through the similarity transformation, the matrix might have been changed, but its characteristic polynomial remains same as earlier. Okay. The characteristic polynomial of A and the characteristic polynomial of B turn out to be the same. If the entire polynomial is same for A and B, then all the roots will be same. That means, that eigenvalues remain unchanged through a similarity transformation because similarity transformation comes out only as a result of a change of basis. No geometrical entity is being changed, only its representation is being changed and eigenvalues are the property of the underlying linear transformation, not of the basis. And therefore, eigenvalues remain constant through all these similarity transformation. How do eigenvectors change? Geometrically, even eigenvectors do not change, but then their representation in the new basis will change as the vectors as any other vector would change its representation in the new basis through the multiplication of S inverse, which we have already studied in the same manner an eigenvector of A will transform to S inverse V in the new basis, which is given by S. So, if V is an eigenvector of A, the corresponding eigenvector of B will be S inverse V, because there the new basis S has appeared. So, the basis change of vectors takes place through this relationship and the same will apply to eigenvectors as well. Now, let us quickly summarize what are the points that we have discussed in this particular lecture. First important point is that meaning and context of the algebraic eigenvalue problem that we have discussed. Second is that we have studied the fundamental relationships deductions, which are vital for the solution of the algebraic eigenvalue problem. And third, we have been exposed to a quick and easy method called power method as an inexpensive procedure to determine the extremal magnitude eigenvalues, only the largest or largest and lowest or the largest few. In all these situations, we can use the power method with 
a little bit of help from the shift theorem or the deflection technique. But then while applying power method, you must be careful that the power method does not apply to arbitrary matrices, but on certain matrices having particular kinds of eigenstructures. If your matrix falls in that category, then power method will be very handy for you in many situations, but otherwise it may not operate as desired. So, in the next lecture, we will build upon what we have developed till now and see the detailed discussion on the theoretical developments on eigenvalue problem, which will be then used in different categories of methods for solving the algebraic eigenvalue problems. Thank you.